Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Fiveable. I am Melissa Longnecker, and I am going to be your streamer tonight. We are here talking about AP world history in the early modern era. That's 1450 to 1750. So let's make my text big and my face small, and we will get going. Um, okay, so the team is awesome. They're um, posting all kinds of good content, linking people to um, great content, trying to keep you positive and energized as you're getting ready for these big exams, which I know are a big deal for everybody. So let's make the most of it. All right, tonight's agenda. Um, like I said, 300 years, 60 minutes. We are going to go fast and we're going to go big tonight. I'm going to give you the highlights. I was talking to my students about this um, this week for some of the earlier, um, one of the earlier time periods, and the idea that I want to give you the headlines so that you can go back in and know that you're filling in the right details. Because if I tried to give you every single detail that you might need to know about these 300 years, First of all, I would never get through it all in a reasonable amount of time. And second of all, I might miss something and then I would feel super terrible. So instead, I'm going to give you the big picture and I'm going to ask for your participation. So sometimes I'll be asking questions in tonight's stream and I would love for you to drop examples, ideas, suggestions, comments in the chat uh, to help each other out as you are studying because you may be really solid on details about one particular topic. And when you get to a topic that you're less confident in, you might find that somebody else has some really great details that they are um, feeling good about, and you can support each other as we study together tonight. Our main focus, um, right, some key ideas. I'm going to give you an overview of some of the big ideas from this unit. I'm going to talk specifically about some ideas relating to land empires and maritime empires, because those are two terms that the College Board uses. Um, and there's some ideas associated with each of those that are worth kind of digging into with a little bit of detail. Near the end, I'm going to talk about resistance to empires. There's a few other things um, kind of embedded in the two empires discussions as well, but resistance, because I think sometimes we don't start talking about resistance to empires until we get to the next time period, starting in 1750. Um, but the reality is that resistance has a, to empire has a long history, basically, as long as there's been empires. And so it's great to have some examples of that from this time period as well. And I hope to save um, a good chunk of time at the end to answer your specific questions and point you to resources or help um, build your confidence at the end of this stream. So let's do this. All right, so some key ideas, some big topics that I'm going to flesh out with a little bit of detail tonight. I already mentioned that I'm going to talk about the land empire. So I'm going to give you some examples of what I and what really the college word means by the idea of land empires. Because as Mr. Beckman likes to point out, the land empires sometimes had pretty big and sophisticated navies. Um, but their territory was largely connected by land, which is why we call them the land empires. So we want to know where were they, um, where and where and how and why did they expand? Because this era, this early modern era, is an era, an era of imperial expansion. So we want to think about the expansion of those empires, both why and how, as well as consequences. What happened because of the expansion of those empires? Similarly, we're going to be talking about the maritime empires. And these empires sometimes controlled large areas of land, but they're often called that because the center of power was sometimes separated from the colonial territory by water. Um, and so this maritime, this idea of seafaring empires um, kind of distinguishes between the two groups of empires that we're going to look at. And again, like with the land empires, this was an era of expansion. So we want to think about where did they expand? How did they expand? Why did they expand? As well as what were some of the consequences because of their expansion? 
along so as all of these empires are expanding and creating new systems and territories throughout the world we see the emergence of early globalization and i know that this is a term that often gets talked about mainly with the 20th century and mr little next week is going to be talking about globalization in the 20th century but we can think about globalization in the sense of connecting different regions of the world and particularly connecting different regions of the world through trade. Truly global trade is a key idea in this early modern era. So we want to think about how are regions being connected, what regions are being newly connected, what regions continue to be connected, right? Continuity and change is an important skill as we're studying history. And like with the expansion of empires, what are the consequences of this global trade? And then Thinking about as all of this stuff is happening politically, economically, environmentally, um, migrations are happening, right? People are moving and changing. All of this is going to have an effect on societies and on cultures. So what changed and what stayed the same? Those are big questions that we need to answer um, or have some ideas about in this unit. And I just realized I'm talking with my hands a ton. So, um, you know, welcome to class with Mrs. L. I talk a lot with my hands. Okay. So before we get going, I want to give you a suggestion for one way that you might organize your studying in this unit. You're not necessarily going to be able to fill in a chart like this from just my stream tonight. But if you're really struggling, if you're like, I have all these notes for my textbook, or I have this section of reading this fiveable study guide, and I'm trying to boil it down to like the most important stuff, how could I organize my thinking? This would be one way that I really like. As I thought about this early modern era, I kind of broke it down into three parts of the world. Thinking about the Atlantic system, so areas that are touching the Atlantic Ocean, and this is going to include Europe, it's going to include West Africa, it's going to include the Americas, right? They're all kind of coming together in this Atlantic system. And if I think about what's happening as those places interact with one another, I could think about those things thematically. I can think about what's happening to society, how people are interacting with one another based on race, class, gender, or family. I could think about the interactions between places in the Atlantic politically, um, empires and states that are growing, empires and states that are shrinking or being conquered. How is that changing and transforming? Definitely in this time period, we're thinking about interactions with the environment. How do humans affect the environment? How does the environment affect human populations? in that Atlantic system. Knowing, of course, right, that it doesn't have to be exactly bordering the Atlantic, but places that are coming together through the Atlantic. Um, culturally, we're thinking about beliefs, identities, values. Economically, we're thinking about production, trade, and consumption of stuff. And then technology, we're thinking about innovations, we're thinking about actual physical technologies and how those things are being used to make, to change people's lives. And we can do that for the Atlantic system. We can also do it for the Indian Ocean system. And we're gonna get into some detail about each of these later, but I just wanna introduce this chart. The Indian Ocean system brings together East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, and East Africa. So I've taken a whole bunch of world regions and I'm thinking about how they're connecting and interacting with one another in this Indian Ocean system. I also want to think about Eurasia, and I could even bring in Afro-Eurasia, thinking about the land masses. Right? What are the systems that aren't necessarily um, connecting via these water routes, the Atlantic system and the Indian Ocean system, but how are these systems interacting or in some cases not interacting? And already I'm seeing some great examples um, in the chat of people trying to fill in the chart right now as you go. So you guys, you have the vocabulary, you know a lot of the key ideas about this unit. But what I love about a chart like this is that you probably don't already have one. 
My students don't. I didn't give out a chart like this when we were studying this the first time around. But so I would recommend a chart like this because it forces you to take what you know and boil it down into a different format, which forces you to think about it. And that's what's going to help you, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what's going to help you remember it better when it comes to it. All right, so I'll pause for just a moment, let you look at the chart. I'm gonna show it again at the end of the stream. And the slides for tonight's stream will be available under resources if you need to take a look at it, if you wanna create a chart of your own. So let's start by talking about the land empires. And I've got this map here um, that shows just global empires circa 1700. So near the end of the time period that we're studying today. So we have uh, empires, both land and maritime on this chart. It's just a whole big old global um, map of empires. But can you name some of the major land empires who were particularly prominent or significant in this early modern period? Boom. Oh, my goodness. Like 50 people started answering right away. You guys are on top of it. Um, look at that. OK, so let me show you the ones that the College Board specifically references and then a couple of bonus ones that um, I want you to pay attention to as well. So um, the Qing, which I saw on the list um, come out in the chat. So the Qing Empire um, in East Asia would count as a land empire the Mughal Empire in South Asia, the, uh, the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, and the Safafid Empire in the Middle East as well. These are kind of the four big land empires that uh, you've probably studied. Textbooks really emphasize these four. The College Board really emphasizes these four. There are others um, some of them, if I'd had a map from 1450, we would see a few more land empires. I picked this map from 1700 because it allows me to use the same map for land and for maritime empires. Um, so um, that's why uh, I'm going with that. But yeah, there are others, but those are the big four. Two additional ones that I think are worth noting um, would be Japan and Russia. And I include Japan as a land empire. And I know that may be a little bit controversial. Some people may disagree. But Japan's imperial characteristics share more in common with the other land empires, with the other Asian land empires, than, um, than it would with the maritime empires. Because Japan wasn't really focused on its navy. They were beginning imperial expansion. Um, but it's largely on the islands that we kind of associate with Japan and into um, the, the Pacific, but not the, the widespread expansion that we'll see from Japan in the 19th century. Russia also is a land empire that, um, that the College Board has stopped mentioning as explicitly, but that I think is a great example um, because it has parallels with both the Asian land empires and the European empires um, even though most of those will fit into maritime empires. Um, I saw a question earlier about Rome or the Byzantines. Neither of those would fit for this early modern era, particularly. Um, but the Byzantine Empire would have been relevant as an empire in an earlier time period. And as we think about characteristics of empires, if you were thinking about contextualization and bringing in an earlier time period and relating it to a prompt about this early modern era, that could make more sense. Um, the Byzantine Empire um, uh, falls kind of in its final stages in um, the early 1450s. Um, so it, it, it's technically in this time period, but just barely and functionally belongs more appropriately in our previous time period. I also, before we get into some questions about the land empires, I want to mention, right, that at the beginning of this time period, we do still have um, powerful land empires in the Americas, particularly the the um, the Aztec Empire in Mesoamerica and the Inca Empire in the Andes Mountains. Um, they aren't shown on this map because this is a map of the 1700s, um, by which point those empires had been overtaken by European powers. But I want to acknowledge, right, that empires are not limited to Afro-Eurasia. We do see empires and state building of the same kinds of processes that we see in Afro-Eurasia. We see those processes happening in the Americas as 
well. Whew, okay, that was just a lot of like who's who um, and getting some details thrown out at you. So let me ask you um, some questions again um, for um, about the land empires specifically. So as so we talked about the idea that in this period, empires expanded. How did the land empires expand their territory? Be specific. Okay, I'm seeing some awesome, um, some awesome answers relating to technology. Now we want to acknowledge that gunpowder was not invented in the early modern period. Gunpowder is actually much, much older um, and harkens back to um, East Asia. Um, even really previous to the beginning of our um, AP World History course. But in this period, 1450 to 1750, we see an increased use of gunpowder. We see the development of cannons um, and as a particular technology utilized um, by um, expanding empires. We see the development of armed trade. So, um, so we're going to see, right, military expansion, but also arms trade, protecting trade routes, um, claiming territory um, as a part of trade. Um, I see some, some other good details relating to uh, religion. Um, so religion isn't necessarily a great answer for how did the states expand, but it is important for thinking about how states consolidated or brought together their power once they had expanded to take over new territories. So we we could think about um, some of the religious pieces um, as a um, as a link to imperial expansion um, or as a consequence of imperial expansion. How did that factor into um, were there was there religious conflict? Was there religious tolerance? Um, how did states deal with issues surrounding religion um, if or as they expanded? Um, so people are giving some really great detail about the Devshirma system and the Ottomans, um, and they are important. They're an important source, right, of um, soldiers for the Ottoman military um, because they were extremely loyal to the Sultan and allowed, um, but they weren't the sole source of military power. Um, and so it's both religious and military. Um, it's, it's excellent. Ooh, Annika, I hope I'm saying that right, Annika, I'm um, talking about the tribute system, right? Yeah, we do see an expansion of power that sometimes states are expanding power by, um, by threatening outlying areas and demanding tribute rather than conquering those territories outright. That's excellent. Um, I'm starting to see people answer this second question, other consequences of expansion. We see rebellion and resistance, which we're going to talk about in detail later. Syncretism and blending of cultural ideas, languages, religious traditions. Those are consequences of expansion. Um, cultural diffusion is a consequence of expansion. Absolutely. We also see, right, that as states expand, they bump into one another. And so we start to see, right, as states expand, some of them hit kind of a finite limit because they've bumped into other powerful states that they were unable or unwilling to conquer. And so we see competition and rivalries and conflict between states, um, both as a result of geographic competition, but also potentially, right, like neighboring religious rivalries. If we think about the Ottomans and the Safafids, Dan beat me to it. That's right. Um, the Ottomans and the Safafids, who are both Muslim, but they, um, but their leaders um, emphasize different sects of Islam, and so actually increased the tension between Sunni and Shia Islam because of their political divide um, and their political conflict with one another as their borders were right next to each other. Absolutely. Um, as states expanded, right, we want to ask the question about consolidating control. Um, and I phrase the question a little differently here, but how did rulers maintain control and authority in their territories? We've got emperors claiming the idea of divine right or a continued connection to religion or divinity. Um, we see 
tax collecting systems that rulers are like demanding taxes and they're demanding tribute, right? Wealth is flowing from the outlying areas to the centers of these empires. We're seeing the use of arts and architecture to glorify or legitimize the rule of particular uh, leaders. And we see the use of the military, not just as a tool for expansion, but as a tool for um, imposing power within a territory as well. We see um, right religion being used to legitimize control, people who right either religious tolerance, emperors showing themselves as being wise and benevolent by allowing the um, practice of other belief systems or the insistence of rulers on people following their belief system. And, in, and both things happen. Um, and we want to think about different examples of those. We've, all, we've kind of already started to touch on this. You guys are so good at this that you don't even need my questions. But we want to think about, right, these empires are super diverse. Anytime an empire really starts expanding, it's going to start conquering territory where people who aren't like the conquerors are already living. So we, we have these empires that are multi-ethnic, they're multicultural, they're multi-religious. Um, so how do the empires deal with diversity? The answer, and my students will know this, <laughs> the answer is with anything in world history is it's complicated. It depends. Uh, so we want to think about right examples um, that might fit with different responses. Um, so think about the ways that different empires. So how did empires impose or enforce a religion or a culture? So sometimes we do see um, right um, emperors and kings promoting um, like state sponsored missionaries. Yeah. Um, the jizya tax in um, Islamic areas, the tax on non-Muslims, was a way to incentivize conversion to Islam or to make the rulers rich if people um, chose to um, continue their practice. Kiki, I'm going to come back to Sikhism um, in a minute, but um, you're right to think about it. Yep. Religious tolerance, the flip side of that, right? We see examples of religious tolerance where rulers allow the continued practice of traditions different from their own um, in order to keep peace um, amongst their different people. Um, yeah, so lots of um, different examples. We've got Akbar and the Mughal Empire um, with the divine faith. Um, we have the Qing Empire really relying heavily on um, Confucianism and Confucian scholars as bureaucrats, the continuation of the um, civil service exam. Yep, you're all very correct in thinking about. Now, this isn't necessarily an answer of how China's dealing with their multicultural population. China's response is largely summarized as forced assimilation. I mean, not every um, ethnic and cultural group in China does assimilate, but but groups who are brought into the empire were strongly encouraged to assimilate and to um, to join Chinese traditions um, in order to see acceptance at the higher levels of government and society. So yeah, absolutely. You guys have got some great stuff, which brings me to my big pause, because at this point, if you were an AP world teacher, this would be the point where the college board is like, oh, and by the way, you should teach some religious stuff in this early modern period. So I want to talk specifically about some religious trends and developments in this early modern period, not because they are only relevant to the land empires, because they sure are not, but because there isn't a better place for them in my slideshow. So I put a little big pause button here to um, just acknowledge the fact that this is going to feel like a weird jump. And we want to remember that these religions, and these religious developments are occurring in the context of all of the political, economic and other developments that we're about to talk about tonight. So three kind of big political or not political, big religious and cultural trends that I want to make mention of. These are not the only religious things to know about in this early modern era, but these are three big ones that you definitely should know. 
Number one, you should know about the Protestant Reformation. You should know that it represents a fragmentation of Christian traditions. Um, right? This is this is Martin Luther and various Protestant leaders and groups um, first seeking reform within the Catholic Church and eventually splintering off from the Catholic Church to create their own religious sects. We see the reform, the counter-reformation, it's sometimes called in the Catholic Church and the emergence of groups like the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. Um, and we see that the Protestant Reformation first splinters Christianity, but then leads to an overall growth of Christianity because um, there's a movement from both sides to gain followers. And as both, you know, as different sects are now competing to gain followers, they start looking outside of traditionally Christian territories in order to find new followers. So we see a heavy emphasis from Catholics, especially in um, Spain and Portugal, uh, to send state-sponsored and church-sponsored Catholic missionaries into um, Asia and into the Americas to gain more converts for the Catholic Church. Um, we see right, there are other like we can we could spend an entire stream on the right the fragmentation of Christianity in this time period. But we want to acknowledge like all the things that you know about um, the Protestant Reformation and the impacts on. Um, Christianity and places affected by Christianity, that's relevant. You should keep studying that. For Islam, um, right, I've already mentioned that the political rivalries of the Ottoman and the Safavid empires led to more increased, not more increased, more intense, that's the word I wanted, more intense religious rivalry between Sunni and Shia um, Muslims. And in fact, right, Mr. Beckman was reminding um, reminding us on some earlier streams in the past couple of weeks that it's this political rivalry that makes the religious rivalry so significant. And that prior to that political rivalry, the division between Sunni and Shia, while they existed, weren't at the same level and they certainly weren't to the level of causing violence between different groups as we see from this point onward. And then I want to talk about South Asia and Sikhism because um, I have been really educated over the last couple of years from some students in my school who are Sikhs um, who have really um, made me careful in the way that I speak about Sikhism um, because I think a lot of books and too many teachers um, teach Sikhism as Hinduism plus Islam. And if you speak to Sikhs, um, they will tell you that that is not the case, that that's not how they view their religion. Um, and so in order to be respectful, right, of the tradition of, of people that we know in our communities, we want to acknowledge that Sikhism is developing in this early modern period. And it's developing in a context, right? It's in South Asia, um, so what we know as India, but it's developing in a context of both Hinduism and Islam, right? By this point, Hinduism and Islam are both in um, South Asia. And so these religious traditions are things that people would have known about, would have been exposed to. And so we see elements in Sikhism that are um, similar to both Hinduism and Islam, but it comes out of a particular spiritual tradition and um, special revelations of the Sikh gurus who um, bring their message then to the people and create a, a really a different way of being that tries to um, equalize people um, and create a more harmonious um, way of living with one another. So that's just my little like, half a mini spiel on Sikhism um, because I want you to, um, when you encounter people who are Sikh practitioners, that you are able to be knowledgeable and respectful of their traditions, um, just like you are of some of the more familiar Western traditions as well. Um, you guys are doing a great job in the chat of filling each other in on some additional details. I'm gonna let you keep doing that. I'm going to check in on my question box and see if there's anything before we go on. 
Okay, I'm seeing questions specifically about the DBQ. So I'm gonna come back to those at the end um, and we'll just keep talking content and see how much of this we can get through and how fast. Okay, so religious pause over. Let's jump into our next big idea. So we've talked about the land empires and I'm going to talk about the um, the maritime empires in a second, but I wanna talk about global trade first um, because global trade is a way where we can start connecting the land empires to the maritime empires and we're gonna see them interacting. Um, for the first time in history, trade is truly global, uh, right? Because we've got now the Americas connected to the Afro-Eurasian trade systems. We've got the development and emergence of a new trade system in the focused in the Atlantic Ocean. And the impacts of that include some things that are not routinely on like review lists. So I wanna acknowledge, right, that the expansion of this global trade is going to have effects on Europeans, Americans, Africans, Asians, and people from Oceania, right? Every single world region is going to see effects from this global trade. And some of those effects are going to be positive, but we're gonna see positive effects in every world region for some people. We're gonna see negative effects in every world region for some people. So it's not a story of where like, one region is just 100% winners and another region is 100% losers. We want to think about who are the, the winners and losers overall. There's some specific like economic vocabulary that becomes really important um, with global trade. So I'm just going to run down a quick list. I'm not going to give definitions. I just want you to have this list. So if you need to take a screenshot at the end of the slide, I'll pause and let you do that. Um, but terms you should know. You should know mercantilism. You should definitely know mercantilism. People um, misuse that term a lot. You should know what joint stock companies are. You should know what I'm talking about by an Atlantic trading system. You should know what a monopoly is. Now, these terms are highly kind of Eurocentric, Euro-focused trading terms, um, but they're also kind of broadly applicable economic terms that are gonna show up potentially in some of your other coursework later on. Um, so they're just good terms to know, definitions of specifically. But like I was saying, we want to think about winners and losers um, being specific. So an example that you may not think about, right? You may want to think about Western African kingdoms like the Asante and the Kingdom of Congo, um, who actually grew and increased their influence as a result of their participation in Atlantic focused trade. So when we're thinking about winners and losers, right, we want to think not like painting whole swaths of people. We want to name specific examples of places that we can. People are given definitions of my vocab in the chat. You guys are awesome. Um, I'm going to pause right now, take a drink of water, let you get a screenshot of my weird economic vocab, and then we're going to keep flying because we have to. Okay, friends. Um, so the maritime empires, we've already mentioned the idea that a maritime empire is an empire where the center of power of the empire may be separated by water from the territories that that empire controls. And so this is really where we're talking about, right, Europeans expanding in their initial spread um, into other regions. Um, some of this is going to be specifically state-sponsored exploration that's going to lead to the expansion of these empires. So we want to think about, um, in the case of the Portuguese, the development of maritime technology, which I'll mention here in a second, some navigational skills that are going to lead the Portuguese to their travel and trade um, around the coastline of Africa into the Indian Ocean. And for the Portuguese, the key phrase with their maritime empire is a trading post empire. The Portuguese control relatively little territory in Africa and in Asia, but their trading posts allow them to dominate the um, 
the merchant traffic, um, especially in, well, not to dominate the merchant traffic, but to heavily influence merchant traffic in the Indian Ocean um, and have some pretty significant effects in those um, areas. The Spanish um, sponsorship, right? We're thinking about Columbus and voyages across the Atlantic, but also eventually voyages around the Americas and into the Pacific, um, as well as Spanish sponsored voyages into the Indian Ocean that will increase just general European interest in transoceanic travel and trade. Northern Atlantic crossings um, were sponsored by the English, the French, and the Dutch often trying to find an alternative route to Asia so that they didn't have to deal with the Spanish and the Portuguese, who in many cases got there ahead and were imposing um, some strict regulations and or just sinking rival ships in those sailing areas. Um, and so as we're thinking about right this global trade, but also then this corresponding expansion of maritime empires, we want to think about how did it happen? What made this possible? Why Why is now, why is the early modern period the point at which we see Europeans or anybody really crossing the Atlantic and bringing the Americas into contact with the rest of the world? So we've got state sponsorship, we've got governments paying for it. Mm -hmm, that's part of it. We've got innovations. Yeah, this knowledge and scientific learning um, is really important. And it's technologies that were not invented by Europeans, but that have spread into Europe from the classical period. So from you know ancient Greece and Rome, from the Islamic world, from Asia, across right the land-based trade networks into Europe. Um, and then European continued development and expansion of these technologies. So we've got new tools, um, we've got you know an astrolabe and a compass, we've got star charts and knowledge of both astronomy and wind patterns. We've got new ship designs like the caravel. Um, all of these are things that put the Europeans in a position to be successful in their expansion in a way that they had not done so previously. So as the Europeans are outward bound, as we like to say, um, we're going to see interactions between Europeans um, and other groups in the Indian Ocean Basin. As we think about Europeans in the Indian Ocean Basin, like my big headline, my major continuity is that the Indian Ocean Basin continued to be dominated by Asian merchants. The Indian Ocean continued to be dominated by Asian merchants. And this, I think, is a mistake that a lot of people make. They say, oh, the Portuguese got in there and they totally messed everything up. They did. The Portuguese got in and disrupted things significantly. But Arabs, Indians, um, Southeast Asian peoples continue to be the primary merchants and primary traders, even as the Portuguese um, became the dominant force on the seas themselves near the end of this time period. Um, or the middle to end of this time period, we continue to see um, the, the influence of Asian merchants. The European disruption looks like this. We've got the trading post empires, which are largely a form of economic rather than political control of a region. So we've got the Portuguese establishing um, like defensible forts as trading posts in major trading cities along the coastline of Africa, um, ports in Arabia, as well as um, in India and Southeast Asia. Um, the Portuguese are going to militarize maritime trade. And this is actually a really significant change. Trade in the Indian Ocean had been largely peaceful prior to the um, entrance of European merchants. Um, ships were not heavily armed. Uh, for trade before then. But European um, maritime trade was heavily armed because in the Mediterranean, you had to be armed in order to fight off the, the Venetians and the Ottomans and you know whoever else wanted a piece of the action in the Mediterranean. So they brought that mindset into the Indian Ocean and became like a dominant military force on the seas because they already had the cannons on their ships. We also see the Cartaz system um, that imposed fees and fines to allow ships safe passage so the Portuguese 
wouldn't sink their ships. Um, and um, so that is a big change in a European disruption. We also see an, um, the entrance of American silver that actually flows across the Pacific and enters the Indian Ocean system um, th through um, Southeast Asia and through East Asia. Um, and so there's a connection, not just between the Americas and Europe, but between the Americas and Asian trade as well by way of Europeans. Some Asian empires tried to limit disruption by excluding European traders. And we have to be a little bit careful here because a lot of books and a lot of teachers talk about isolationist policies, particularly of China and Japan. And definitely, right, we've got documents and edicts from the Japanese, especially um, imposing really um, strict restrictions on who could trade or where people could trade in their territories. But what we want to acknowledge is that they weren't excluding all trade. There was a lot of tra China is trading with a lot of people. Japan is still trading. They have to trade. But they're choosing with whom they wish to trade. And they're excluding certain Europeans in particular. The Portuguese and the Spanish especially being excluded from trade um, in Japan, whereas Dutch trade was more welcome in Japan. And this is a place where, right, if you were talking about this on a DBQ, you could talk more complexly hmm, um, about this topic. Um, but so we but we do see that as a an, a response of some Asian powers and sometimes attempts at excluding European trade were successful. Other attempts to exclude European trade were unsuccessful um, because of the armed presence of European merchants. All right, I'm going to check my question box. Um, we've got a question here about. Um, Silver in Ming China and Asia in general. Um, it's it's interesting. I, I've been doing some reading about this, and um, one of the kind of the broad realities is that China manufactured essentially anything it needed or wanted, and wasn't interested in trade with Europeans. We we know that, but there wasn't silver available in China. And the the Chinese government, the Ming government decided that silver was the ideal way um, to like secure wealth for themselves. And so they they imposed a policy where um, right, they, they wanted taxes to be paid in silver. There was a need for a desire for silver. And so that became a way for Europeans to kind of break into trade with China um, because as American silver starts pouring through the Spanish Philippines um, into Japan and then trade with Japan, bring silver into China, we see this increase of silver in China. It's gonna have uh, an inflationary effect on China's economy. It's a big, complicated, messy story. Um, but what it does is it it provides a little bit of an opening, I would say, um, that it that further incentivizes Europeans to try and find ways to continue trading with China or to better their trade relationship, to try and equalize their trade relationship with China so that it wasn't just China selling everything and the Europeans desperately buying it. Okay, um, let's, let's talk about the Americas because we're already 45 minutes in and we got to keep moving. <laughs> um, so one of the big things is we talk about the Americas and the expansion of um, European empires, especially into the Americas. We have to talk about the Colombian exchange. You know about the Colombian exchange. And if I asked you to tell me what kind of stuff is coming from the Americas into Afro-Eurasia, give me a list. Go chat. It's going to explode right now. All the things. Boom, there it goes. Look at everybody with your awesome list. It's primarily food crops from the Americas. Um, there are some, some things like tobacco is not a food crop, but primarily food crop. Got potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn or maize, cacao, chocolate, tomatoes, chilies, etc. Right, from the Americas, primarily we're seeing American food crops. And the reason I emphasize the food crops is because these are the American um, product that radically transforms Afro-Eurasia. Um, lots and lots and lots of new foods, calorie rich, um, 
can be grown in a variety of climates throughout Afro-Eurasia, um, grown in different kinds of soils and affecting the soils in different ways than Afro-Eurasia crops did that really, that radically transform um, some nutrition in Afro-Eurasia. From Afro-Eurasia, Afro we see different kinds of goods moving across. We see cash crops like sugar, cotton, etc. We've got animals. Primarily the animal movement is from Afro-Eurasia into the Americas. Um, horses, cows, pigs, etc. Uh, people are moving from Afro-Eurasia into the Americas, including explorers, settlers, conquistadors, enslaved persons, right? Not all of the movement is voluntary. And then the big one, which everybody immediately started identifying as soon as I said Colombian exchange, you all started saying smallpox, malaria, measles, influenza. I heard something recently that some earlier form of coronavirus um, believe it or not, was probably one of the multitude of diseases brought by Afro-Eurasians into the Americas with a devastating impact on um, indigenous populations, right? The key factor um, relating to like demogra population demographics is we see an initial dip in the Americas um, where as much as 90% of the indigenous populations of the Americas died as a result of disease, um, political collapse, economic collapse, warfare, including civil wars between groups as other elements of society collapsed. There would be a population recovery with the movement of people from Afro-Eurasia to the Americas, but that initial population um, decrease is really significant. It's often in many textbooks referred to as the great dying. In Afro-Eurasia, the effect of the um, Columbian Exchange is largely positive with a population increase because of all of the new foods becoming available in Afro-Eurasia. There's lots of details we could, you know, John Green spends a whole 12 minutes talking even faster than me just on the Columbian Exchange. There's tons to say about this. Um, and I am confident that this is information that you can fill in the gaps with, but I just wanted to give a quick overview of it. So things to know about the Americas. The Atlantic trading system, we should know this phrase. The Atlantic trading system involves colonies and territory claimed in the Americas for economic purposes. Um, that are being connected across the Atlantic to both Africa and Europe. And then through Africa and Europe, we see the connections um, trickling into Asia as well. In this Atlantic trading system, um, the colonies in the Americas are mainly agricultural. And so these are plantation agriculture, where we have a large territory being planted with a single crop, generally a cash crop for export and for sale, rather than for use by the people who are actively growing it. So sugar and cotton are two really good examples of cash crops grown through plantation agriculture. Um, it is also important to know that the labor force um, in this agricultural system um, developing in American territories is largely unfree. And so, right, my big umbrella category of unfree labor includes the um, Spanish who co-opted the Inca Mita system to impose labor obligations on um, indigenous peoples. We've got enslaved persons um, being brought, either being enslaved from indigenous populations or enslaved persons from Africa being brought into the Americas and forced to do labor. Um, indentured servants, which are different from enslaved persons um, because they, they there's more of a contract. So enslaved persons in the early modern era tended to be enslaved um, based on race. They tended to be enslaved for not only their lifetime, but their children's lifetimes with really no legal mechanism for freedom. Indentured servants sometimes entered unwillingly, other times entered the, the contract willingly, but they would offer to do labor um, in order to pay off a debt. Um, sometimes it was like a criminal debt, so we would see indentured servants in criminal populations. We would see indentured servants um, who were paying off their passage to the Americas. We would see indentured servants paying off other kinds of debt through labor to a, a specific employer. And sometimes um, these folks come from a variety of populations, including European populations. So it's an unfree labor system 
that includes European laborers. The encomienda and hacienda systems are another unfree labor system specifically in the Spanish American colonies. Um, the, the encomienda kind of umbrella is a system where um, a, a Spanish um, landowner was granted a, a specific number of native laborers who would um, pay labor tribute to him in exchange for protection, education, um, and care. And often the encomienda system happened on haciendas. So haciendas are large landed estates in Spanish America um, where right, the landowner um, in order to make a profit would demand labor tribute from the surrounding indigenous peoples um, and then sell the products of their labor to benefit himself and would you know, trickle out some kind of supposed benefit to the people around them. Um, it's not to a rosa the hacienda system isn't too dissimilar from right a manor system in Europe, um, but it's more exploitive and it is more based on cash crops rather than like um, like community living kinds of things. Um, in addition to these agricultural systems, we want to acknowledge that in the Americas, um, there are major mining operations sending silver across the Pacific into East Asia. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not just silver, it's not just Potosi, but those are two great examples to think about when we're thinking about mining operations because the Europeans are investing in whatever um, systems they can to get rich. So, right, if you can grow crops in an area, you're going to grow the crops. If you can't grow crops, but you can dig up shiny metals, you're going to dig up the shiny metals. Um, so, so that is a big that. Okay, we've got a couple of questions um, about this section before I go on to the next um, piece there. Um, Kiki, you're getting some good answers in the chat about the Mita system. So I'm going to answer this question about population in Africa. Population in Africa is really complicated because we see an overall increase in Africa's population as a result of foods from the Colombian Exchange. There are some blips and some dips in that as the Atlantic slave trade picks up and enslaved persons are being removed from Africa in higher numbers. And if we dig deeper into the population numbers, we'll see that um, certain groups in Africa, um, largely men of laboring age, um, that population diminished um, more substantially than other populations because those were folks who were most likely to be taken as enslaved persons. Um, and then it recovers, the population in Africa recovers largely um, because of nutrition after that. Okay, cool, cool. Getting close to my questions time. Um, what we wanna think in particular, this is true everywhere, but it, there's the probably the easiest examples are in the Americas, so we wanna think about them. But the big idea here that I wanna talk about next is that when people start mixing, right, as people groups are blending, cultures are going to blend and new social organization systems are going to emerge. People are already filling the chat with my examples. You guys are awesome. Um, culturally, we're gonna see a spread of Christianity, right? The cultural diffusion of Christianity out of Europe and into, especially into the Americas. We're going to see though also cultural syncretism, right? The blending of African, indigenous American and Christian traditions um, in different ways in different populations in the Americas. But syncretism, right, is that word that means blending. Um, so we've got a couple of examples with uh, voodoo or Santeria, a couple of religious traditions um, specifically, but we also see right cultural syncretism um, in food cultures. We see cultural syncretism in um, right things that are not strictly um, religious, but that blending um, is um, particularly important. Socially, um, we've got things like the Costa system uh, in the Americas. So the right the the development of a social hierarchy based on race and based on um, blood quantification. So like what percentage of certain heritages are you that creates um, we often think that it's just a like a very like, um, you know, peninsulares, Creoles, mixed race peoples, um, indigenous peoples, enslaved persons. Um, it's if you look at some of the charts, they're crazy and far more complex than that. Um, but it reflects right people trying to reorganize how they define society because they now have more groups 
to accommodate and then they have to figure out what to do with that. Um, so we got these racial hierarchies. But in addition to kind of these like classic examples, we want to acknowledge that there are social changes that occur to families um, as well. Um, so gender and family restructuring is especially notable in Africa as women take on um, more um, leadership roles in communities um, as a result of losing so many men from their communities because of um, enslavement. Um, and so we see um, the, you know, an increased practice of polygyny, um, right? Men marrying multiple wives so that their, um, so that family heritage can be passed on and the, the women can have um, children if there's not enough husbands to go around. Um, some examples of that. Um, in we also see, though, right, the emergence of new political and economic elites, um, not just in the Americas, right, if we think about the peninsulaires, people of European descent born in Europe, and the Creoles, people of European descent born in the Americas, but we also have um, right, similar um, elites emerging in other empires outside of the Americas as well. Um, so we just want to acknowledge all of that. Oh my goodness, I'm at 58 minutes and I still have to talk about resistance and answer some questions. We're probably going to go a little past six o'clock, but if you need to leave at six for your commitments, I totally understand. Um, okay, Whew. challenges to empire. Here's the headline. Empires were not inevitable. It's easy to tell the story of history from the perspective that the empires just came out and conquered everybody and nobody could do anything about it. The reality is more complicated than that. It's complex. History is complex. So are you. You're complex thinkers. You can do it. Um, resistance movements occurred both within empires and on the fringes of empires. And resistance movements occur in land and in maritime empires. So you need to know an example of resistance to empire. So I'm gonna give you three very briefly. There are more that you might know additional ones. So if you don't know one of these three, but you know a different one from this same era, you're fine. Um, but if you don't know any, here's a, a few that you could look up. The Pueblo revolts, a resistance to Spanish conquest in um, what's now the American Southwest. Some really um, compelling stories about the Pueblo revolts and the success of some of those revolts and the, the largely independent or autonomous groups that were able to, to keep their independence even when they were in Spanish controlled territories, so indigenous peoples. Um, we see the Maratha conflict um, with the Mughal Empire. Um, so another um, minority group that sought to push back against um, Mughal power. We see resistance in um, d various parts of Africa. Um, Ana and Zinga's resistance in um, West Africa is um, a really fascinating story that incorporates some women's history as well as thinking about um, African history in a way that we don't necessarily get. I'm seeing people in the chat talking about the Cossack Rebellion in Russia. I didn't put it on my list because I was running out of space on my slide, but you're right. Um, absolutely, we're talking about, right, you need to know an example of resistance. So if you know some detail about one example, you're in really good shape. I also want to draw your attention to the special example of slave resistance. Jackson, you're here. Hi, Jackson. Jackson's one of my students who was on top of it. I said the word slave resistance. The Jackson was like maroon societies. Yes, the maroons were um, escaped enslaved persons. Um, in uh, the Caribbean, um, most notably in the British controlled territories in Jamaica, who um, not only like escaped enslavement, but also fought against um, the British and were um, pretty like fierce and intense warriors um, and gained some measure of autonomy and independence in Jamaica. Um, they came to a peace treaty agreement with the British that gained or that, that guaranteed them um, some freedoms because they um, they were able to resist the growth and the power of these empires. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the empires and I really just wanna remind you that resistance to empire still happens. Kiki, Ethiopia is gonna be more relevant in the next time period, so in the 19th century, but you're right to be thinking as imperialism moves into Africa in the 19th century, resistance movements occur in Africa as well. 
So how did you do? Right. We talked about the idea of starting to put your idea, your key vocabulary, your key ideas into a chart kind of like this. Um, do you know some more things that could go on this chart than you did before? I'm not going to ask you to fill them out right now, um, but if you know them, um, right, feel good about what you have done today. Whew. All right. It's, oh my goodness, it's 6.02 um, and we're just now getting to your questions. So I'll stick around for a few minutes um, and answer some questions. If you could put them in the ask a question box, I'm going to be able to keep track of that a little bit faster, a little bit better than with, with the chat because you guys are so fast in the chat. But feel free to keep talking in the chat as well. Um, questions. Um, Okay, so I did have a question about writing the DBQ itself. In sourcing, do we have to use all aspects of HIP and then connect it with our prompt, or can we do only like purpose or point of view, et cetera? Um, Mr. Beckman answered this for, for you, Juliana, but I want to answer it out loud for everybody because I literally taught this lesson today in my Zoom class with my students. You need to use one, one characteristic for your sourcing. And yeah, Mr. Beckman is right. Think of HIP. Um, or any acronym that your teacher taught you as a menu of choices. Choose one characteristic of the document that is significant, describe it, and then connect it to your argument. Um, do I recommend any number of sentences for one body paragraph? More than one. I should, <laughs> that's my, I know that's a silly answer. Um, but uh, like truly, I, I recommend that you write enough sentences to complete the argument that you're trying to make. You should have a topic sentence. I love topic sentences because they tell your reader what your argument is. You should have sentences, plural, of evidence. Your evidence can come from the documents. It can come from your outside knowledge. There should be some number of sentences of evidence. You should have evidence connecting, or not evidence, you have sentences connecting that evidence to your argument. So it's going to take some number of sentences, and it's really going to depend on your argument and how many documents or pieces of evidence you're choosing to use. So do what's going to do what's going to make your best paragraphs, however many sentences that is. If your if your paragraphs end up being too long, don't worry, no one's grading your grammar. So um, also a shout out to all of you in the chat who are continuing to participate and come to these streams and help each other out and answer each other's questions. Um, I am just so encouraged by this community on Fiveable and how hard everybody is working. If you put as much effort into your DBQ essay as you are putting into helping each other and being um, supportive, right? distance learning teammates, um, you guys are going to be great. I have full confidence in you. And um, I'm looking forward to some of the debrief streams and finding out how it went all for, for all of you. With that said, I'm going to close out tonight. And I will be in chat on some of the streams coming up in the next few weeks. And I hope I will see you there.